Good morning, plastic surgery world. I'm John Polly here in Chicago at the Rush Cranial Facial Center. This is an article by Dr. Hopper and his team. I'd like to start by first piling accolades to the authors for this really outstanding work. This is excellent work. These are difficult cases. They've achieved uh, outstanding results, and the patients uh, at their cranial facial center are very fortunate to have physicians of such high caliber and high quality uh, be able to give them their care. I think the one thing about this paper is that it really highlights the power of rigid external distraction. Um, there are so many things that you can do with external distraction of the mid-face uh, and it's really brought out in this paper. External distraction allows flexibility, it allows um, us to variably advance different portions of the mid-face as the authors have, uh, have uh, exemplary demonstrated. Um, we can rotate the mid-face, we can change our uh, treatment plans uh, as we go if we need to, at least to some degree by varying the amount of advancement and different levels. Um, also, uh, with adult patients, not so much mentioned in this article, but it allows us to really help control occlusal relationships to avoid, in many patients, final Lefort osteotomies uh, for final occlusal uh, positioning. Um, so the flexibility of external distraction is, is really demonstrated, and its power demonstrated very nicely in this article. With our traditional techniques, we're much more limited. Uh, what we do on the table is what we get. Uh, with internal distraction, which I have a lot of experience with as well, um, indicated for some patients, but again, limits our flexibility uh, as illustrated by this article. Let's talk about a couple of the approaches that they used. Um, first, uh, very interesting and very nicely done are their hinge osteotomies. This is something that we do uh, very commonly, in particular for hemifacial microsomia patients for vertical facial elongation. We'll do a Lefort one and piggyback that onto a mandibular osteotomy and, and uh, do a hinge vertical elongation of the face. They've applied the same principles for the mid-face reconstruction. In particular, they describe more yaw-type rotational uh, uh, discrepancies that they're able to treat with uh, variable rigid ex external distraction. But in addition, um, which they don't really point out in the article, but we can certainly um, also very commonly we use it to, to uh, control the pitch or rotation of the mid-face as well. Uh, and also, if need be, we could use it to, um, for the roll uh, as well, but these are less common requirements. Um, they also applied this technique in patients where they would osteotomize the zygoma, reposition it interoperatively, fix it interoperatively, and then go on and continue with an osteotomy at the Lefort 2 level and perform that with distraction. These were for their patients that had variable discrepancies in the central portion of the mid-face and the malar complex. And again, excellent results with these. The final thing is their, is their nasal passage graphs. Um, they're or what they call their passenger graphs. And that's where they um, utilize bone grafting. They utilize rib grafts for a tomahawk type nasal reconstruction uh, for the chiamella and the dorsum would place this interoperably at the time of the osteotomy and then do the distraction and actually distract these grafts. I think for these patients, this uh, brings up an interesting point, and this will be debated uh, as long as we're performing craniofacial surgery, is the difference between Lefort 3 osteotomy distraction and monoblock osteotomy distraction. And in many patients in our center, and particularly the APERTs, where they have that central nasal root deformity, we're able to successfully bring that forward to the degree that we want it with the monoblock osteotomy uh, and then avoid the tomahawk grafting as they, as they use for their Lefort threes. But I think if you're going to use a Lefort three, then the tomahawk is probably the best way to go. Uh, I would say for the majority of our APRIS patients, uh, we end up not needing any nasal root grafting after the monoblock advancement, but for some we do, so um, and that's something we can uh, carry out at a secondary procedure. The other thing which I didn't mention is uh, in the case of the illustrated with the aprons, which has an excellent result, it looks like that boy had had prior uh, le le frontal orbital advancement and had quite a uh, moderately severe forehead deformity uh, preoperatively, which it looked like they corrected interoperatively. And again, uh, what we'll commonly do is actually sometimes undo some of that frontal orbital advancement, uh, most commonly with varying techniques and then perform monoblock osteotomies for these patients. And again, and our philosophy has been we would get a better aesthetic result, but certainly the result that they show with this procedure is excellent. So again, an excellent article. Looking forward to seeing it in the, in the uh, journal. Uh, my hat's off to Dr. Hopper and his team. They did excellent work. Congratulations. Keep up the good work. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and farewell from Chicago.